I'm Joel Garrow. I'm a co-director of this initiative. Uh, Future Tense is a partnership among uh, the New America Foundation, Slate Magazine, and Arizona State University. Uh, our goal is to look at not just at emerging technologies, but to ask what do they mean for our culture, values, and society, and what it means to be human. Did you know that Bay Pio is the on-campus restaurant? Oh, hello. Welcome to Carnegie Mellon University in Cover. Feel free to talk with me in English or Arabic. What's your native language? How can I help you? English is an important language. I am a roboceptionist. What do you do? I'm a bilingual roboceptionist. I should be able to answer Carnegie Mellon related questions in Arabic and in English. Try me. Which is how we end up with this question about our killer robots, um, job killer robots. To get to 1004, you need to take the entrance to your left, then turn left again, walk straight and take the second corridor to your right. It should be one of the offices inside. Thank you. You're welcome. How old are you? A robo lady never reveals her true age. Let's just say I'm not the newest model on the block. Have a good day. And remember, the next time your computer doesn't work, don't hit it. We have feelings too. Dr. Reed Simon, thank you so much for taking the time for this interview. And first we'd like to know from you, how can we call a robot socially interactive and how is it different from any other robot? So, most robots, when they operate, they only take them, themselves into account, their own safety, um, their achievement of their own goals, so how fast to get to a particular location, how easily it takes to do something. But in social interactions, you take other people into account as well. So you have to understand what they're trying to do and what you can do to help both of you um, do something smoothly. So like when you're getting onto an elevator, if you barge into the elevator, when people are trying to get out, you block the elevator and no one can move. So the people who are getting on wait till the people get off and then they can get on. And by doing so, by understanding that there is a, someone else who is trying to, to achieve a goal to try and do something, then you can get uh, both people um, acting very smoothly and they won't interfere with each other. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the basis of social interaction and socially interactive robots are robots that not only take their own um, 
goals into account, mm -hmm. but also the goals of people around them. Mm -hmm. So how does a social interactive robot really work? So basically, the main difference is that what I said, that they have to understand what the people around them are trying to do and, and, and act accordingly. Um, so one of the things I like to say is that most of us think that uh, the rule, the social rule for getting on and off eleva on, onto elevators is that you wait for everyone to get off the elevator before you get on. Mm -hmm. But that's actually not the correct rule. The correct rule is that you wait for everyone who intends to get off the elevator before you get on. Because some of the people aren't going to get off. They're just waiting to go to another floor. Mm -hmm. And so when we, as people, and the elevator opens, when we as people decide whether we want to get on immediately or wait, mm -hmm. we have to look at the people in the elevator and try and understand their intention, try and understand whether they want to get off or whether they want to stay. Mm -hmm. And that understanding of the other people's intention is what is uh, critical for making socially interactive robots work. Mm -hmm. They have to not only know what they want to do themselves, but they have to perceive the people around them and try and understand what those people are trying to do. And people don't have signs on them that says, I'm getting off on floor three, I'm getting off on floor four. Um, the robots have to look and, and, and try and understand cues, such as gaze. So when the elevator opens, people who aren't getting off tend to look down. People who are getting off tend to look up, want to make sure it's the right floor. Um, some of them, you know, they start moving. You have to detect the, them moving forward versus just rocking back and forth. Mm -hmm. And those types of simple cues are things that is, are very difficult for robots to do. So we pick up those cues very, very quickly um, because we've been trained from, you know, from birth to pick up these social cues. Mm -hmm. But uh, robots have to be programmed to understand those cues and it turns out to be a very difficult thing for them to understand what those cues are. Mm -hmm. So what techniques is CMU doing to enable robots to act in a socially acceptable way? So we're looking at basically two different types of uh, social interaction. Mm -hmm. One is what I call conversational interaction, which is basically what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. So while I'm talking to you, you're looking at me mm -hmm. and you're nodding at me to, to indicate that you understand what I'm talking about. And uh, if you were to start looking off over to the side there, I would know that um, I had lost you and I need to say something in order to get you back into the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of conversational interaction. And uh, Hala is an example of a conversationally social interactive robot. Mm -hmm. um, so it uses gaze to try and um, bring people in to engage them. Um, it uh, you know watches them as they as they type on the keyboard, and um, it has it knows enough about um, how conversations run to respond appropriately. Mm -hmm. Someone says hello, the robot will say hello. If someone says salam, the robot will say salam, um, and uh, you know so it, it 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 does the appropriate thing in the in the right in the right context. Um, the other aspect that we're looking at is what I call navigational um, interaction, and that is how robots can navigate through space in a socially interactive way. Mm -hmm. So the getting on and off elevators in a socially interactive way, uh, passing in corridors, so when people are coming towards each other in a corridor, one person moves to the right, the other person moves to the right, and they pass without really having to think very hard about yeah. how to do that. And that's a social rule. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it's not only a social rule, it's a cultural rule. So in places like England and Japan, where they uh, drive on the left-hand side, um, they don't pass on the right, they pass on the left. Mm -hmm. And so if you were to go to England and um, not understand that, then you would start bumping into people. Um, so you have to know what the social rule is in order to um, uh, work well in the society. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do you see the international efforts in the area of social interactive robots and how do you, where do you see the Qatar fits in? So when we started this work, we were focused on social interaction. Mm -hmm. And um, 
the idea was that there were these kind of universal social rules that people obeyed. And it turns out that that was simplistic, that um, it actually is not only social rules, but cultural rules as well. Mm -hmm. So the way that uh, people interact in um, different parts of the world differ somewhat according to the culture. So um, a, a Middle Eastern culture uh, has somewhat different social rules than a, than a Western culture. Mm -hmm. And so what we're looking at in, in, um, in Qatar, especially with Hala, mm -hmm. is to try and understand those cultural differences and be able to develop a system that can be um, uh, social and culturally appropriate in Qatar. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, if you were to take it to the United States, we, it would be socially and culturally appropriate in the United States by changing a few, um, a few variables, a few parameters. Mm -hmm. um, right now what we're doing is just trying to explore the various ways that these robots can, can differ. Um, but one, one, one uh, example in navigational interaction is that um, there is this idea of personal space, how mm -hmm. close people will come to one another when they're talking. And in uh, different cultures, the personal space is larger or smaller. Mm -hmm. And we can characterize that. We can say, OK, if you're in uh, Mediterranean culture, the personal space is much smaller. And we can tell the robot this is mm -hmm. the size of the personal space when you're in Italy, for example, versus the United States, where it's much larger. And then the, uh, the robot can, can behave like an Italian or like an American. Mm -hmm. So what do we mean when we speak about the gap between the robotic behavior and the social interaction? What, what do we mean by this gap? So again, the, the, the basic gap is um, understanding other people. Um, it's this idea that the robot is not operating in isolation, but it's operating in a peopled environment, and it has to understand not only what it is trying to do, but what the people around it are trying to do, mm -hmm. and to behave in ways that um, facilitate the not only its own actions, its own goals, but the goals that it, of, of the other people. Mm -hmm. So um, when you, uh, when people are you typically, typically when you talk about people being antisocial, mm -hmm. you say, oh, he was, he's, he's very rude, he's very antisocial. What they typically mean is that this person only thinks about himself and doesn't think about anyone else. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, the, that's the same thing for the robots. The robots, um, if they behave only thinking about themselves, then they tend to look antisocial. And when they start considering other people, then they, then they look more social. Mm. So the main thing that we have to look at is how we can get them to understand that there are people around and what those people are interested in doing, mm. whether they want to um, you know, um, have a conversation with the robot or be left alone or um, be escorted somewhere mm. or um, you know, that they, that they're, they, they have um, you know, certain, certain other needs. Those, all those things need to be understood by the robot in order to be looked at as social. Mm -hmm. So what future uses can socially interactive robots be used in? So my personal philosophy is that social interaction um, can be applied anywhere that we have technology. Mm -hmm. So not just robots. So you, you, you might think of robo the robot receptionist is a very good example. Uh, service robots. So a robot that is uh, coming in to, let's say, clean floors. Mm -hmm. It needs to know that there are other people around there. Maybe it shouldn't come into this room because there are people working. It goes to some other room first and then comes back to this room later so it doesn't disturb the people. Mm -hmm. Maybe when it comes in, it asks very politely, um, is it okay to clean the room here, rather than just barging in and cleaning the floors? Um, but other technology as well. Um, think about all the things that we use these days that are um, electronic. Um, 
uh, cell phones, microwaves, uh, DVRs, televisions, stereos. All of those have very um, unsocial interfaces. You know, they're, they're buttons and knobs and things like that. They don't understand what people are trying to do. Think about the, uh, a world in which you know your microwave knows what how how you like your tea to be heated in the morning, the the, the temperature of the water, and when you come in, you don't have to press all these buttons. It just recognizes, you know, here's someone here with a with a teacup. I know that he likes it at you know, um, this particular temperature, and you just put it in, and it says, oh, you know, good morning, nice to see you again. I'm going to heat your tea up like you normally like you like it, and you can say no. I'd like it a little warmer today um, than usual. Okay, I'll do that for you. Mm -hmm. That's social interaction. You know, you can think that's that's how you would do it if uh, you know two people, a couple living together. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have to, you know, you don't have to press buttons. You just talk to them, and, and um, they understand you, and they know what you like, and you know those types of things can be that type of. Social interaction can be used anywhere that we have technology. Mm -hmm. It would make interacting with our, our, our technology so much more useful. Mm -hmm. So when we have a social interactive robot, how can we evaluate it and make sure that, how can we assess its effectiveness? Um, so we're very lucky in, in, in that respect because psychologists have been doing um, experiments on humans, how humans interact for many, many years. And so there's a well understood methodology for um, uh, understanding human human interaction mm -hmm. and measuring it and measuring its effectiveness. So basically, we use the same technologies, the same mm -hmm. tech, sorry, we, we basically use the same techniques uh, that the psychologists use in order to um, evaluate and measure. So, we do a lot of user studies, we bring people into the lab that, and, and, and ask them to perform certain tasks with the robot. And then we uh, look at how well they perform the tasks. We ask them to rate their experiences with the robots. And through that, we understand which techniques work better, which techniques work worse. Mm -hmm. um, with, with HALA, uh, it's a slightly different thing because uh, HALA is out there. We don't invite people in. But uh, when people interact with HALA, um, all the interactions are recorded. And we can do experiments. So um, one week we can run HALA with a certain um, program, and the next week we run it with a slightly different program, and we can compare how people interact with them, how long they interact, um, whether they um, say thank you to HALA um, when, when she answers their questions, how frequently they, they, they do that, um, how frequently um, you know, what types of questions they ask. And we can use that to try and understand whether changes that we make to Hala's behavior um, actually improves the interaction or, or, or worsens it. Mm -hmm. And based on that, we can, we can f go further in the research and develop other techniques. Mm -hmm. So my final question, tell us about the lecture you gave about social, uh, social interactive robot at CMU on April 19th, and how did you find the audience response? Um, I think it went rather well. Um, I'm always, it's always hard for me to judge how my own talks go. But uh, there seemed to be a lot of interest in, in this idea of social, social robots. Um, there was, actually what was interesting to me is there was a lot of discussion about why you would want to have a social robot. Mm -hmm. um, so the, one, of the one of the things that, that people might ask is, why would you want a, a robot that behaves like a human rather than a robot that behaves like a robot. You know, um, we don't, some people are afraid that if, a, if robots start behaving too much like humans, mm -hmm. that it will um, lessen the difference between robots and humans. Mm -hmm. um, but, so there was a lot of discussion about that. I think though that uh, in general, you do want robots to act more like humans because we know how to interact with other humans. We don't know how to interact with robots right now. Mm -hmm. So if we have a robot that behaves differently than anything we've ever seen before, 
we have to learn how to interact with it. That takes a lot of effort. So you put a, you put a robot in, let's say, um, uh, an, um, a facility where um, the elderly are, and have the robots, you know, try and help the the elderly get around. Um, older people, they're not going to want to uh, learn how to interact with this very complex mm -hmm. machine. They they know how to interact with people. They know how to interact with the aides in the in the, in the facility. You just want them to the robots to interact in the same way, so people don't have to learn new ways of interacting with this very complex technology. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed Simons, for this interview, and wish you the best of luck. Thanks Thank a lot. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Human autonomy is the result of the seamless integration of our perception, our cognition, and our action. This uh, autonomy is this integrated ability that enables humans to perform by themselves without the need to be teleoperated. Autonomous robots aim at this same capability, acting without being teleoperated. So they have sensors, like distance sensors, cameras, they use their computers to plan for their actions and they move. So Cobot, this mobile robot at Carnegie Mellon, performs tasks for users in our building, picking up and delivering objects from location to location. Sensors uh, provide a very large amount of complex numerical data from temperature levels to distance to obstacles, walls, uh, people, furniture from which robots need to interpret features about the scene so they can plan for their tasks. For example, a robot needs to know their position. And for that, Cobot uses their 3D scene images to try to extract planar surfaces that are matched to walls and then to maps. And the more accurate is this mapping, the more confident the robot knows where it is. This is a robot that actually moves in our environment, performing tasks, going from location to location in very different uh, environments in terms of their appearance, from corridors to halls, and even glass bridges uh, with success. However, in spite of the significant advances in uh, having robots move, Robots have many cognitive perception uh, limitations at the perception, cognition, and action level. And they definitely cannot understand all natural language and perform all actions such as going upstairs or opening doors. So at Carnegie Mellon, we actually uh, introduced a new concept of autonomy for robots, this symbiotic autonomy, it, which enables robots to ask for help to overcome their limitations. So please press the elevator button this says an armless cobot. Please put the envelope in my basket. And humans can help with these very simple requests. Cobot can also go to the web if it's, the request involves something for which it misses knowledge. For example, bring me coffee. If Cobot does not know where coffee is in the building, it queries the web and then goes to the most probable place returned by the web where, co where the object can be. In this case, kitchen for coffee. It also interacts with humans through dialogue and can ask for clarifications. And when it doesn't understand what the human says, it may pop up some kind of other representation, such as a map, where the humans can specify what they mean by conference room or what they mean by printer room. And all these interactions with the humans and the web are saved for future use by the robot. Finally, if the robot does not get its help, uh, it waited and nobody pressed the button, it also automatically can fill email messages, templates with the situation, emails to the developers and asks for some remote help to come to the place where the robot didn't get the help. We have been talking about the single robot, but after all, our research involves multiple robots, multiple cobots that coordinate to actually uh, optimize their task and share knowledge. Such cobots have moved at Carnegie Mellon close to 1,000 kilometers in uh, the last two years. Our multi-robot coordination is motivated 
and builds upon a lot of the work we do in robot soccer, in which robots beautifully plan for joint motion and teamwork that leads into this beautiful four-way pass that ends with this successful goal. Our multiple robots at Carnegie Mellon, in addition to actually doing the, their pickup and delivery tasks, uh, have introduced and have performed a very novel and new task of data collection. They move in the buildings with their sensors and knowing their location, and they can collect temperature, humidity, Wi-Fi signal strength data, and provide these maps for great policy making based on the data. So symbiotic autonomous robots, it's a reality. Multiple robots, multiple humans, the web, the physical space. So we can see these robots as cyber, physical, social systems, kind of a new species that coexists with humans. So the ultimate final question that we face is how to move these robots from our labs and our buildings to the real world is how do we, we actually envision interacting with and uh, getting help from these fascinating uh, new artificial kind of intelligent creatures? Um, I want to give a special uh, bow to our partner Slate today. Uh, especially, I'd like to ask Tori Bosch to stand up and take a bow. She's the editor of our new Future Tense channel, being launched on Slate uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, that's a space to watch. Um, on Slate this week, you're going to find a terrific series uh, by Farhad uh, called Will Robots Steal Your Jobs? Uh, I strongly recommend it to you. It's a terrific piece of work. Uh, is Josh Levine here yet? No, I guess not. He will be here later, I guess, the executive editor of Slate and the uh, editor of this series. Uh, don't we have robots that can do that? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Well, he's not here. He's a robot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the reason we're here today is that when robots came for the automobile assemblers, I was not an automobile assembler. Uh, but now they're coming after the doctors and the lawyers and the journalists. So these are the white collar eating robots. Uh, and of course, by robots, we don't just mean Wall E. Uh, we mean artificial intelligence writ large uh, that is actually now arriving. Uh, and if this freaks you out too much, remember that we'll be having adult refreshments at the reception afterwards. So <laughs> um, a few housekeeping um, thoughts here. Uh, remember, this event is being webcast, so everything is on the record. Uh, if you choose to speak up, please wait for the microphone. And please introduce yourself, and please be concise. Uh, so now let me hand this over to the star of the show, a columnist for Slate who writes about the technology industry, new products, and social media. He is the author of True Enough, learning to live in a post-fact society. Ladies and gentlemen, Farhad Manju. Hi. Hi, thanks, and thank you all for coming. Um, so, so I want to talk a little bit about the series. It's, it's um, focused on this question that I've been thinking about for a, uh, a while, because uh, many members of my family my dad and my wife, uh, my dad's a pharmacist, my wife's a doctor, she's a pathologist, and um, she spends her days looking at slides um, that have images that uh, may contain cancer in them and may not. And this has always seemed to me like a problem that's not well suited for humans, because <laughs> it's sort of like TSA agents, right? They have to, um, you have to sort of be very focused and also spot something rare it seems like a thing that a machine would be better at. And in fact, when I talked to my wife, you know, many of her colleagues are kind of uh, afraid of this. And this was the spark of um, the series, which is a look at robots and machines that will be replacing people who are paid a lot to do their work, but whose work is in some sense uh, vulnerable to machines. Um, and so, so the people on this panel, I think, speak to some of this. Um, and, and we wanted them here because they, each come at this um, from a different sort of standpoint. Um, so Michael Schmidt, uh, he is, uh, as a graduate student at Cornell, he worked on a project called Eureka, which 
um, was a, a shorthand way of saying it is it's a robotic scientist. Um, and what it does is it looks at um, data from the physical world and comes up with fundamental laws uh, of science, of nature, from, from that data. And he can talk more about it in a little bit. Um, now he's the president of Newtonian Inc., which is a business that's focused on expanding this, uh, this uh, graduate project into, into a business. And he can talk about that too. So Sarah Kramer um, is the next person. She is a doctor, a family practice doctor. And the reason I wanted hear her here is because um, I write about her in the series as someone who is actually not vulnerable to machines. And her, 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 job, her, her job, I think, is one of the few jobs I found that you know, maybe in 50 years or more, we'll see, she could be replaced by a machine. But before then, I think it's going to be difficult. And we, we can talk about why. Um, and then Robbie Allen is uh, trying to get my job because he is the founder <laughs> of Automated Insights, which is a company that writes uh, automa automatically uh, produces news stories from data. So their first application was to look at all of the stats from um, various sporting events, baseball, basketball. And you can look at all the stats in a game and come up with a pretty good story uh, that is not written by humans. Um, so we, I, I wanted to talk, I, th I think I wanted to start to, um, with, with Robbie because you have the most um, sort of impressive demo of like if we want to see whose jobs are vulnerable next, we would look to your technology. Um, tell us about how the robotic sports writer works and then I wonder if you can talk about you know, what, what it can do beyond writing sports. Sure. Um, and real quick, you compared your wife to a TSA agent. Does she know about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, she's not, I'm lucky she's not watching this webinar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know, it, conceptually, our technology is, is pretty straightforward. We take a large amount of data, um, which actually is not very easy to compile. Um, we write algorithms and create a, a database of phrases that we then use to determine based on a particular situation, in this case a sporting event, which of those phrases apply to that game. And then we do various replacements in the data that will include the stats, player names, uh, venues, that type of thing. And then when you piece it all together, it's, it's a fairly coherent um, three to four paragraphs worth of content describing the important um, events and, and things that occurred in a particular uh, sporting event. Um, so in order to make this happen, we needed sort of a, a combination of uh, skill sets. I have a background in computer science, but I've also written um, several technical books. Um, a couple of years ago, I had the thought that I wanted to create the next great sports blog network. For those that are familiar with SB Nation, which is a local uh, startup that uh, is probably the most popular collection of sports blogs, um, they have about 400 writers on staff. Uh, that author all of their, their blogs. And I thought, well, I'd like to do something like that, but I wanted to automate it. And so that's kind of where this notion came along that I thought if I could marry my expertise, programming and writing, that if I had the data, I could just create technology that would automatically produce narratives. Can, can I just, because yeah. that seems a peculiar thing. Why, you know, you wanted to create a sports blog. Why did you want to automate it? Like, who thinks of that? Well, so StatSheet, when I originally started StatSheet in 2007, it was just me, I, you know, before I raised any money. And so in order for me to scale, I had to automate everything that I could do. You know, I so couldn't... it was just sort of a manpower issue. It was a manpower thing. There's no way I could have a 400 writer staff within a year or two. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought, well, if I could automate it in some way, then that allows me to scale more quickly. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I found interesting is that... Um, you're doing a lot of work. Uh, you're creating a lot of sports stories that uh, compete with what human writers are, are creating, but you're also creating sports stories that human writers could never do because they're focused on a team so small that you wouldn't be able to pay a human to do that work. And now a robot can. Um, I think this is, and I found this in in many different fields. Um, it's a, it's a situation where the robots are giving us things that, um, you know, they're benefiting society at large. There are some people who want to read about those sports who just 
you know, those teams who just can't because there's no human writing about them, and now we're getting that from, from robots. Um, so do you think of it then, you know, your technology is replacing humans, or do you think of your technology as supplementing humans? So this is a question we get all the time, mostly from journalists. Um, which when I, when got to pay the rent. When, when, I, when I started this, um, you know, the initial sort of blog post I wrote about it on our company uh, website automatically got like a half dozen reporters emailing me within 30 minutes <laughs> to know are they going to be automated out of a job. I personally don't see it that way. I don't think that what we're doing is going to automate journalists out of a job, um, at least yet. So I think there's a couple things. One is we can have broader coverage than what a typical person can do, as far as I mentioned. You know, there's a lot of teams that just don't get adequate coverage in the sports space, and so we can do that very inexpensively. The other thing is I will say, while it's potentially not right now that our content is as good as a human writer, it is gonna, it's getting better every day, and within the next three to four years, it will be better than what a human can produce. And the reason for that is pretty much the, the foundations of, of computations. We can analyze and access significantly more data than what one person could ever do on their own. So if you think about writing, it's a solitary event. One person sits down and writes about something. With our technology, we can incorporate multiple people's understanding and logic into our software. And then over time, we can improve it in such a way that it can, it can be you know, improved at a greater rate than what one person can possibly improve on their own. And so we get to take advantage of all the benefits that you do in traditional software, but in writing words. Um, a similar. I found a similar thing in, in what you're doing, Michael, because well, let's, maybe you can start by talking about how Eureka works and then talk about Newtonian, because I think what you're trying to do with Newtonian is also allow people to get uh, scientific insights in a place where they wouldn't normally be able to hire scientists to do it. Sure. So I've spent the past uh, five years or so working on this sort of robotic scientist project. And the goal has been to accelerate scientific discovery and make it easier uh, uh, to, to understand data and to uh, figure out relationships and the meaning behind uh, phenomena you might observe in the laboratory. And what we're able to do is, is design an algorithm that can look at uh, a set of data. So it could look at, say, a swinging pendulum. And then just think about that data for a while. And then uh, in the end, it comes back and it says, aha, F equals MA. And this will tell you how, how all pendulums work and many, many related physics and things like this. Hey, but explain it, how it does that. So how does it do that? So it's, this is a type of artificial intelligence where we're, we're searching over a space of uh, equations. So F equals MA is an equation. Uh, F equals M of, uh, divided by A is an equation. There's actually an infinite number of possible equations, but only a few actually make sense. And the algorithm uses a evolutionary approach to compete multiple equations together so that the right equation emerges and the uh, filters out only the, the most meaningful expressions until it can narrow down to, onto the, kind of the single fundamental salient property of, uh, of the system. So, so like F equals MA or equal, E equals MC squared. And uh, so we had a lot of success with this. We got a lot of press about it. People got very excited. So we released so this software so people could do, it, could do it at home. And the software is called Eureka. You can actually download it. It's completely free to try out. Uh, just go to Eureka.com. And you can throw your data in there. You can see what the hidden mathematical properties are in the data. Um, and then other scientists have, mm -hmm. have used it. And you were telling me uh, about, um, and, you know, in, in all fields of science. So you did it on physics, first of all, on, on mm -hmm. a set of physics equations. And we knew the equations you were looking for there. These are things that Newton found. Mm -hmm. But now people are using it for, to break new scientific ground. Yeah, the really interesting thing is when, once people have things that they don't didn't already know about, they don't understand it, but they have the answer. We're kind of turning the tables on how science is, is going to be done because you'll have solutions, you'll have answers, but not necessarily the accompanying explanation that goes along with them. So uh, like you said, a lot of people have, 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 um, have tried this out and used it. Actually, you can go to Google Scholar and see it. There's around 50 papers now that have come out that have used results directly from the software. And it's really exciting to see. Um, there's, these are things where, where ordinarily people might struggle for years figuring out the math behind their data, or they might uh, not be able to afford a PhD student to, to analyze their system or, or investigate their, their uh, uh, product or, or, or whatever you have. So we're trying to empower people to make them 
understand things more quickly and to cross the gap from being able to get the data and manage the data and understand the system to filling in the details of what is the fundamental physics behind the system. Right. And that's where the software comes in in Newtonian. Just one more question before I get to Sarah. But, uh, so what is, so it sounds like many scientists have responded positively to this. Mm -hmm. Have you heard people who, you know, are worried about this kind of software replacing the human humans in? Oh yes, absolutely. Yes. So uh, after the our, our paper came out in Science, I think in 2000, the end of 2009, and we got a lot of interesting emails and letters and uh, phone calls from people that are very concerned about conspiracies and saying to. to uh, <laughs> To, but to like, stay where, I mean, were they crazy people or were they real <laughs> scientists? See, I can't always tell. Right. So I'm not an expert in this. Problem but with what's email. the difference? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one man's crazy is another man's genius, right? So, um, yeah, so some people are, are surprised. But I think once people actually try it out and use it and see what, see what it can actually do for them, they actually get quite excited about it. And you think so, of it as a kind of a supplement to humans. Again. Oh, absolutely. So we're trying to make everyone into a Newton. We want to make everyone uh, strong enough in their math and their physics to be able to uh, make those leaps that ordinarily they, they just couldn't afford to do. Right. So the, the interesting thing about what Robbie does and what Michael does is they, they, they both are fields that involve a lot of data. It's a lot of structured data that they can analyze and kind of get an answer. Um, what Sarah does is interesting because she's, so she's a primary care doctor. People come to her every day with problems. and it seems like you could have a computer that would just, you know, I could submit, you know, it hurts my, my leg hurts when I do this, and then it would give me an answer. Tell me why we, and, and in fact, I've, you know, there are diagnosis software out there, mm -hmm. and um, IBM is trying to turn Watson into something like mm -hmm. that. Tell me why y we need you. <laughs> so. A little bit of context, yes. I am actually, um, as we discussed before, I'm actually an end user of a lot of yeah. um, data that is derived. I do use an electronic software. Um, certain elements of medical diagnosis have actually been automated for a long time, and the easiest one is EKG. Um, the EKGs have had automated algorithm-based interpretations for, I want to say, close to 20 years, and they work pretty well. And uh, it hasn't put cardiology out of business, though. Um, so, so to answer the question about why, di you know, diagnosis is, is handy and actually the faster you get the diagnosis, it's kind of like having, you know, I would imagine having something analogous to, um, is it Michael? Yes. His yes. software using, you'd be like having this, like a team of really super smart medical students kind of looking everything up in the journals and telling me what's going on and that would be super handy. Um, but in primary care especially, so much of what we do is both contextual and also translational. Um, because in primary care we say, you know, the patient is the nurse. They have to walk out of there knowing what to do, how to manage it. I mean, you may come to me and you already know you've got an ankle sprain. I mean, you know, the diagnosis is uncontroversial. It's a matter of what are your goals? What's your past history of ankle sprains? Do you want to run in a marathon six weeks from now? What is your, you know, what is going to be the plan around that? Or one of the um, stories I was sharing with Robbie outside in the hallway is I saw a young man recently He came in and he had been having a cold for two days. Uh, the diagnosis was uncontroversial. If you plugged it into Watson, it would clearly be a viral cold. There, he was healthy as a horse, didn't smoke, didn't have asthma. There was like nothing wrong with him. The context of his concern was that his girlfriend had just been diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma and he came in and said, I can't get her sick. What can you do to keep me from getting my girlfriend sick because she's going through you know, she's going to have her immune system wiped out and have a bone marrow transplant. So that's where, you know, the diagnostic algorithms only get you so far. And then it's the context and then the translational piece. And what is the patient really there for? There was no other reason why this otherwise healthy guy was in my office because he had a cold for two days. Right. I mean, one of the things that I found in, in um, reporting on this series is that a lot of people in their work do kind of mindless work a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And it's the mindless portion of your job that is most vulnerable to robots. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like a lot of your work, I mean, you were telling me that the moment a patient comes in, you're sort of always kind of watching what they say, their body language, um, how they say it, trying to figure out if they're lying. Or yeah. And lying is very rare, but usually you're trying to sniff out what is the real question. You know, in this case, the, the, the example of the young mm -hmm. man who had um, 
you know, the, the girlfriend who was diagnosed with cancer, that was pretty straightforward. He was willing to share it. People don't always want to share about it. Um, people can be victims of child abuse, domestic abuse, substance abuse, all sorts of things that maybe, surprisingly enough, if I actually ask them the question, they'll tell me that I have to think to ask that. Or um, recently I saw a woman who was, you know, grieving the loss of, a uh, very tragic loss of her 26-year-old son, and she was complaining about it, a lot of insomnia, and she was going on and on, and finally I told her, and I said, um, you know, if you get some sleep tonight, you know, Jason won't hold it against you. And I, and I had to say that, and she looked at me and said, I needed to hear that just now. The, the barrier for her getting the sleep was that she was, she was using that insomnia as a means of, it was like a token of her grief and her loss. If I could interject real quick, I, I think one underlying fallacy of the whole, will robots replace humans, is this notion that there's only one right answer. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you have, you know, these set of issues, that'll lead to this diagnosis. I mean, she's mm -hmm. pointed out that that's not the case. It's the same with writing. I, I kind of chuckle every time a journalist asks me, are you going to automate me out of a job? So what you're saying is if I wrote, if one of our robots wrote a perfect story on about a particular event, that means nobody else needs to write anything else about that event. You know, same with science. I think there's no better case than, you know, the, the, the situation where E equals MC squared may not be valid. You know, so what if a robot had computed that, and does that mean we should no longer look into that? So science should just stop. No more investigation into that because it, a robot said it, therefore it's true. So I think, you know, there's a little bit of a fallacy that if a robot can do it, that means humans and, or anybody else should just stop looking at it. You know? Well, but it's not a fallacy if you consider that your software could do it at a you know fraction of the price that any human can. So maybe we'll have so that I mean that sort of replaces all avenues for humans to write, right? I mean, uh, if the software can do it extremely well as well as a human can, maybe you'll have three different flavors of the software writing three different stories. But why would you want a human to do it? it and that may be, I'm just saying where we're at now. Uh -huh. You know, I don't think we're in any danger of automating humans out of a job for most of the things we're talking about. That's probably the next sort of step down the path. Once we've had, you know, several evolutions of all of the technologies we're talking about before that would even be realistic. Mm -hmm. But also I'm thinking like in the case of like a biography writer, you know, a, a biography writer would write a very different story than an autobiography writer. So even if your type yeah. of software could empower someone like, okay, in the future everyone will write their own autobiography it would still be a different story that was told. And, and look at all the number of biographers that have written so many different stories about you know, famous people because they take particular aspects of that and, and look at their life through a different filter. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the greater danger, I think, is when these, these sort of approaches break away from us entirely. For example, say your algorithm starts writing uh, articles only for other computers for example, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the similar thing in, uh, for science is the, the algorithms could break away and we, they start doing science that we can't even understand, we can't keep up with. Um, but for, they find it useful, they continue on, they, they break away from us. Mm -hmm. The real danger here <laughs> is... <laughs> I just is, want to... Is that... You, you think that's a real danger? Explain why in, that's in, not in, science fiction. So we're, we're getting to this point where uh, uh, we, we can generate results that we don't immediately understand. We're analyzing things that are, 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 are more complicated than we can even possibly uh, uh, appreciate, right? And we, uh, so a famous mathematician um, who's actually on my committee, uh, Stephen Sorgrath said that we're actually in a very special time in the, the whole evolution of mankind and science technology. because so we're in a special window where we can actually understand the things around us. Uh, most of the science, all the science that's been done in the past thousand years, we're fortunate that it's simple enough for us to actually understand and appreciate. But you can see now, especially when we start analyzing social networks and uh, uh, a lot of kind of the cutting edge technology in, in physics and things like this, uh, the systems are too high dimensional for us to, to understand or wrap our hands around, um, that uh, we're fundamentally limited. And if we want to step beyond that, we're going to need these sort of automated approaches. Right? And then it gets us into the, the, the situation where we find results that we cannot understand. And we fundamentally cannot understand because they're too high dimensional for us. That's to what you mean by break away from break us? Break away from us, yes. That's what I mean by break away from us. And, and I don't have, think that's too far away. I mean, uh, you, know, you mentioned Watson. I mean, the thing that was just very interesting to me was last February watching the Watson Jeopardy Challenge where IBM software and hardware, uh, you know, beat 
two of the best Jeopardy challenge uh, champions at a very humanistic game. I mean, Jeopardy, you know, who 10 years ago would have thought that software could beat Jeopardy champions at a very humanistic game? It's already happened, and it was, wasn't even a close. Right. And so that's at a humanistic game that they can already, software can beat humans at, much less going beyond that in questions that humans can't even understand, but, but computers can potentially process and understand. I mean, I, I think, talking to you, Michael, and your advisor, Hod, Hod Lipson, the, the kind of the, the thing you guys struggle with is that the computers will give us the answer. We won't know what it means. And this sort of <coughs> philosophical question that arises out of there is like whether that's an actual discovery for humans, whether that's actually science. Mm -hmm. If the computers understand everything about a certain system, a certain set of data, but the humans don't. Um, and, and you guys are working on ways to have the computers kind of explain it to the humans, explain what they find to mm -hmm. humans. Can you describe that and whether that's possible? Like, are we just, are the computers gonna get so smart that we're just going to be like very dumb compared to them? Yes, well, I, I think the, it's crucial that, that we, we, we focus a lot of energy and attention on uh, not just the technology to make discoveries, but also the technology to explain discoveries and explain them in a way that we can appreciate and understand. So um, being able to connect it to our existing knowledge base and being able to say this is similar to this, but it's much more complicated than you could possibly understand, right? It'd be, so certain things could be like trying to explain quantum mechanics to your dog or something like that. But we still want to benefit from that. So we need some way of crossing that gap and having these discoveries map back to a, a domain that we can still understand and, and make sense of. And I think that's kind of the the long-term future of, of science, I think, will be um, uh, explaining the connections from what we know. And that's the role the humans would play? Um, yeah, I think that's where they sh they'll be focusing on over the next 100 years. Does that mean we need Eureka for humans? Then, <laughs> well, it, I think there's a long way to go, but we need, uh, yeah, this is something that's, that maybe Watson could help out with, right? But <laughs> it's, it's something that's fundamentally human that they would need to understand us as well as we understand our, each other, right? In order to uh, put something in a frame of reference that we can understand. So um, I think that's possible, but I think that's still a ways off. That's, that's kind of an area of AI that's very slow moving at the moment. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, I was thinking about what you do and, you know, so, so the reason that I think that part of what you do will be difficult to automate, we just talked about is, um, and, and other jobs like yours, which have this quality of face-to-face -face interaction and conversation, which computers aren't very good at now. But one of the things that I find about technology is, you know, they're all, it's always getting better at a rate that we can't really appreciate, and it's, it's hard for us to predict the future because, um, because it's sort of always getting faster, and we don't really understand that. Um, do you, do you, and so, you know, maybe 10 years ago, a travel agent might have been in your position and said, uh, no one is ever going to use a computer to book their trip because there's too many variables. It's too complicated. And I won't, and you know, they'll always need me. And, they, and now we don't. Mm -hmm. um, can you sort of respond to that argument and think, and, and you know, could, do, you, do you hold it in your head as at least being possible that we might not need doctors like you in five years' time? So. Let me try to answer this by outrunning my headlights slightly because this is going to get outside my, my area of strength. But, you know, as, as you know, in a lot of other areas of, you know, very high cognitive specialties, we're starting to see much more like what you could simplify as hive intelligence, right? Certainly in the scientific community, you know, you, you don't really see a lot of solo scientists. It's very collaborative. And I think one of the when we see scientific innovation in medicine, one of the things that's really hampering is all, that although the scientific aspects of medicine are very much benefiting from this collaborative sort of hive intelligence, there's a lot of regulatory barriers that prevent us from implementing that. And so then the delivery of medicine, we have two problems. One is the delivery of medicine is still, um, for a lot of regulatory purposes, has to be done in this very you know one-on-one -on -one, um, individualistic style. The other sort of fundamental barrier we have is we're good at aggregating uh, data from clinical trials and from sort of hands-off medicine. So, you know, you could query all the pathologic specimens in your wife's lab, for example, and mm -hmm. you, could, you could get data from that. We don't have a good way of really querying um, 
a lot of clinical practices to really aggregate a lot of data points. And, and some of that ha is very, um, some of that's just kind of hardwired into the culture of medicine, but a lot of it is regulatory. There's a lot of, um, you know, naturally, um, you know, if you did an article about, um, you know, scientists being put out of business or, or, you know, having to fundamentally change the way that they share scientific data, you know, there would be a select group of people that would, in the public, that would care about that and would react to it. If anything hits the newspaper about aggregating patient data and sharing it in the cloud somewhere, mm -hmm. It's, you know, you so can, people's worries about privacy and regulation. Exactly, in a nutshell, yes. That'll exactly. save you. It, In the near term, that is one of the things that's, that's I mean, that's why it's going to, it, it has often been a very yeah. late arriver to this is because we're not able to share data so much and there's so many barriers to, to aggregating. No, I, I, that's an interesting point that I um, touched on in various parts of the series um, is that, you know, there are laws that humans have designed that protect humans. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pharmacists, you, in order to dispense medicine, you need to have someone who's an accredited pharmacist in a location to, for anybody to give out medicine there, you know, even like the, the, te the, the pharmacy tech person who makes minimum wage. Um, and, and so that's, you know, that's a regulation that's going to protect pharmacists, even if we have technology that might be able to replace pharmacists and, you know, give you your medicine from something like a vending machine. You can't really do that because there are laws about that. I wonder if you, but you know, I saw some evidence that might that might change in pharmacy because the economics of having machines do it are so compelling that maybe the regulations might go away. Um, do you think that you know at some point in medicine we may see people may say you know it's really could be good for patients if we aggregate some of this data? We're seeing that in an emerging. Mm -hmm. um, economy certainly in Africa and in China you know these large populated countries where the the medical and, and it's you know infrastructure is very um, skinny there there's a lot more of a compelling argument and and, and a, you know significant reductions in regulatory barriers to implementing a lot more telemedicine and and th and sort of the common practice for delivering a lot of health care in African villages is you know, tribal-based, it's or you know, village-based medicine. It's it is population-based medicine. That's the model uh -huh. that they're used to. Uh -huh. um, I, I was talking to a colleague of mine. It's with the University School of Dentistry, and, and and he just you know, kind of during dinner conversation, dropped the fact that in in China they're going to have this huge problem with dentistry because they essentially do not have the profession of dentistry in mainland China, uh -huh. and it wasn't necessary because they were eating a traditional you know, a Asian continent diet, which didn't, was not significant risk for, for dental disease, but they're starting to see this latest affluent generation is starting to get significant. They're, they're starting to develop pediatric dental disease and they have nothing to deal with it. So that, that's going to be a very, you know, you're going to have a very, uh, you know, an emerging affluent um, population that's very comfortable with technology that is going to have a public health, health crisis and no really good way to scale. Uh -huh. um, we're not going to be able to, you know, train up enough dentists and dental technicians and hygienists to go out everywhere. So there will be some changes like that, yeah. but they'll largely be driven, I think, in, in developing and emerging economies. Uh -huh. So if we don't do it, someone else will. Someone yeah. else will invent yeah. the robot dentist. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> are, do we, are, how are we doing on time? Should we switch to questions? Do, um, okay. Great. Who has a question? Um, this question is from Michael Schmidt, and I, you're, uh, I'm very curious about two aspects of what you said. Who are you, please? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm James Barrett. I'm a documentary filmmaker. Um, two aspects of it. One is uh, the inscrutable nature of evolutionary algorithms. Mm -hmm. What is it about their input and their how they work and what they output that's that's difficult to understand and you could probably use John Koza mm -hmm. for that answer. And then the other question is, uh, are you alluding to, when you talk about um, intelligence or uh, in intelligent machines getting out of control, are you referring in any way to the intelligence explosion? Uh, referring to I.J. Good? Yes, and his so um, in a way, yeah. Um, so let me talk about uh, what evolutionary algorithms are. And uh, the idea is Traditionally, AI has been focused on trying to simulate uh, what, a, what a human brain would do. It has like a memory center, and then it has uh, this computational unit, and it tries to connect these to sensors. 
What an evolutionary algorithm does is, is it just gives a randomness, like a random computer program, random ones and zeros, and it uh, competes them in, evolu in an evolutionary process so that they start with the population and you figure out which ones do slightly better than the other ones and you throw away half and then you recombine those. And eventually a solution emerges because you can do this billions and billions and billions of times. Similar to how in natural evolution there's been millions and millions of, of generations. You can do this in seconds or minutes or hours on a computer and get very, very good results. And that's what a, a, a genetic program or, or a, a, an evolutionary algorithm does, it, is it simulates this process such that a, an intelligent, complicated solution emerges. We don't have to design it from the top down. It's something that comes from the bottom up. So it's not fundamentally limited by our own understanding. That's the idea. So it can produce things that are, are beyond our capability, potentially, to understand, things that are too complicated, or problems that uh, we just haven't been able to tackle ourselves efficiently. And uh, there's been a lot of different applications like antenna design, things like this. So uh, that's kind of what an evolutionary algorithm does and why it's difficult for us to uh, understand them because they're stochastic. They, they kind of come up with, with results automatically that emerge. We don't design from the, them from the top down. We provide a simulation such that they come out, they arise. And uh, you mentioned also the, when I alluding to, I think, uh, what's sometimes called the singularity or the, the technological uh, explosion, things like this. So I think these are, I don't like to use the term singularity because I think it's, it's a very heavy loaded term, but uh, closely related to that, I think something very, very similar where we'll, we'll uh, when I talk about breaking away, this is the, very closely related to the singularity. Some people might consider that to be a technological explosion. And uh, I think it's a good thing. It's something we should, we should push for. Uh, I'm very mo much more optimistic than, than others. So uh, we should let another question. Uh, one more question, I think. Uh, <coughs> Andrew Askland, uh, College of Law, Arizona State University. Um, I, I wonder if, in a, in a way, what we do when we use computers is we, um, we perhaps lapse into kind of a, a probability fetish. That you know that the, the programs are good at sort of identifying, I mean, using the, the salient features, and so that's what we focus on, and, and they're good for that. But it might be the case that sometimes what's really interesting is not amongst the probabilities. Right? So it's easy to imagine a, a program that, for example, writes a story about quarterback Q completing so many passes, so many yards, despite so many uh, interceptions. That could sort of generate over and over again. But the extent something odd takes place in a game that we think is really important, the computer might, would, not, would not notice that. And it seems like data in general could play that way. Something really important doesn't fit into the probability story. And, is, and not just is it missed, but we may sort of have a tendency to, to focus on probabilities and missed the outliers, outlying facts, outlying data. Do you want to answer that, Robbie? Yeah, so <clears throat> one of the things we focus on are the outliers. Because again, for us to compete with the ESPNs and the Yahoo Sports of the world, we have to create content that's different and compelling. And so doing the same thing, as, as writing about the same things they are, um, won't, won't sort of meet that bar. And so the things actually we do focus on are trying to make sure that we look for the outliers because, again, that's what computers are good at. I mean, you say they're focused on, you know, kind of the, the probabilities that are most likely to hit, but they can also be good at, hit, you know, looking at things that aren't likely to hit just as easily if you're willing to program them to look for that. And, in fact, that's exactly what we do because that's one of the benefits that you get with software is, you know, you, you, for the same amount of cycles that you burn trying to look for the things that are highly probable, you can also look for the things that are unlikely to occur. And again, there, there's a lot of value in that that the typical human can't do because they can't process all that information. Um, okay, I think we're out of time. Um, if you have other questions for these people, they'll be probably around here for a little bit. But um, thanks so much, and we'll have another panel soon. <laughs>
Or remember those butler robots in Woody Allen's Sleeper? Are you thirsty, Mr. Monroe? Me? No. No, thank you. Today's robots aren't anywhere close to being able to do the kind of work that robot maids do. Take Rosie from the Jetsons. She can recognize objects, she speaks and understands English. Come and get it! She has fine motor skills, she can navigate through a whole apartment. All these skills are very difficult for our real-life robots. Creating machines that can manipulate the physical environment in the way that a human can is one of the most challenging tasks in robotics. And here's the irony. While today's robots aren't very good at doing our dirty work, they're great at doing our mental work. Part of the reason is that computers are getting much better at understanding language. The movies have long suggested that when computers acquire speech, we'll control them just by talking to them. You know, like the computer in Star Trek. Computers send a subspace message. Starfleet Command. Security Channel Authorization. Alpha 47 authorization required to activate Security Channel. Modern speech recognition isn't as good as that, although it's quickly improving. But the real advantage in computers learning language is that they can start to understand documents. Today, legal robots can search through a whole stack of evidence in a complicated trial and discover incriminating emails, for example. And robots can also be creative. There are now machines that can write sports stories. Software can also be funny. Researchers recently created a computer that's sure to amuse fans of The Office. It can recognize when it would be hilarious to say, That's what she said! <laughs> when computers are shown to be funny, the joke is usually that they fail to understand human sensibilities, like Vicky from Small Wonder. I'm not programmed to smile. Well, then I'll program you two. This is a smile. <laughs> Got it? Got it. <laughs> and computers are rarely shown to be creative. They're almost always portrayed as rigid, single-minded, bent on their pre-programmed mission. There are exceptions, of course. In Star Wars, R2-D2 seems to understand funny when he sees it. Help! I think I'm melting! This is all your fault! <laughs> and then there's Hal from 2001. He about. certainly reacts creatively when he sees a threat to his mission. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. But the most interesting thing about Hal is the work he does. He's identified as a crew member on board the ship, and he takes care of most of the ship's functions. He renders the humans almost irrelevant. In a few years' time, after the robots have taken all our jobs, we may come to see that as a pretty good call. This conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. Hal? Hal? So our next panelists can come up. Hi. So in this in this panel, I, I kind of want to talk about what we just ended with, which is whether um, artificial intelligence is a, a fundamentally new kind of technology and will affect the economy in a way that um, older, that technological improvements that we've had in the past, you know, didn't. Whether it'll sort of actually put us out of jobs or just do what other technology has done, which is spur economic growth and make room for people to get new kinds of jobs. Um, so the, the person who uh, has argued sort of the, the more pessimistic view um, is, is Martin Ford. He is a technologist and he's the author of a book called, um, a great book called The Lights in the Tunnel, which is, you know, argues, I thought very convincingly that things are going to be very bad. Um, and uh, so Martin is from California. He's, he lives in Silicon Valley. He, he writes software, is that right? right? Writes software. And so, and, you know, a, a, a thing that I found in this series is that people who are on the technology side of it are much more. Um, believe much more that robots will come for us th than, than other people. And I th maybe it's because they understand the technology or maybe they just have a lot more faith in the computers. Um, and then we have uh, Michael Lind, who is from here, the New America Foundation. Uh, he's the policy director for the New America Foundation's Economic Growth Program. From what I can tell, Michael believes 
a lot of what Martin says, but is disagrees with some of the timing. So we can talk about that. Um, and then we have Tyler Cowen, who's an economist that many people have heard of, who know well. And I think that I, I was hoping that Tyler would tell us that both of these people were completely wrong. But I think he's not going to say that. So we'll see. Because um, we, we chatted yesterday, and he seems pessimistic as well. But maybe I'm wrong. Um, OK, but let's start with, with you, Martin. Tell, tell me why um, you know, we've had 100 years ago, uh, most of the population worked in agriculture. Then we had lots of uh, automation and mech, um, you know, great uh, technology come about. Now nobody works, very few people work in agriculture, but the economy wasn't ruined. Why won't that same process work out with uh, AI? OK. First of all, let me say that um, I, I don't really argue that everything is going to be terrible, but I, I do think that. <laughs> we're going to have to adapt our economy. I do think that if, if we're unable to make the necessary adjustments, then things could potentially be quite negative. Um, historically, you know, what we have found is that technology has advanced, and the, the economy has always adapted to that. Uh, uh, as Farhad said, the, the example of the mechanization of agriculture is, is one really good example. Um, you know, you used to have most of the people working in agriculture, and now you've got 2%. And you know, what we found is that in the short run, that did cause significant disruption in unemployment. But over the long run, people moved to other sectors. You know, they moved to manufacturing first, and that later they moved to services. Um, but what we found historically is that these technologies, going back perhaps 200 years or so, have been primarily mechanical or perhaps electromechanical. And they've, they've tended to focus in single industries or single employment sectors. Um, and that's certainly what happened with uh, agriculture. Um, but if you look at what's going on today, it's really quite different. We now have this special new field called information technology. Um, it's really ubiquitous. Uh, IT has its tentacles everywhere. I mean, it's going to impact every single industry in existence. And, and perhaps more importantly, it's going to impact any industry or, or new sector that arises in the future. And, and so that really becomes quite different. So now it's much more broad-based. Um, and. Uh, in essence, what you're seeing is that things are becoming much less labor intensive. You know, it, as jobs are destroyed in traditional areas now, it's much less likely that a whole new sector is going to rise up that can absorb all those workers in a way, for example, that manufacturing arose when uh, agriculture was mechanized. And the reason is that information technology um, is going to invade everywhere at once, and it's going to, you know, increasingly form the basis of new industries and new employment sectors that are created in the future. So I think what's happening overall is that you know, the nature of machines is changing. They're becoming more autonomous. They're moving from becoming, or they're moving from being uh, complements to become substitutes. And that's happening sort of overall on the average. And the whole economy is basically becoming less labor intensive. Tyler, what do you think of that? I mean, do you, is it fundamentally a new kind of thing? I do think it's a new kind of thing. But let me outline a more optimistic case and we can all decide what to make of it, since this is what you want. When smart machines <laughs> really take off, there will be much, much more output. Things will be more efficient. There'll be more stuff. It will be higher quality. Medicine will be much better. So there'll be a lot more wealth. Uh, that wealth means it's possible to support many people. So even if wages are low in a lot of sectors, if you own a pretty small amount of capital, you'll still be quite well off. An alternative scenario is that governments own capital to some extent and have more redistribution. There's a kind of guaranteed annual income in this scenario because it's easy enough to afford it. And maybe a lot of people don't have jobs in the contemporary sense, but again, they still do fine. So as long as total output is going up, which, which clearly it is in these scenarios, there's always optimistic corners to these pictures. The other point I would make is I think smart machines will always be complements and not substitutes. But it, it will change who they're complementing. So I was very struck by this woman who was a doctor sitting here a moment ago. And uh, I fully believe that her role will not be replaced by machines. But her role didn't sound to me like doctor. It sounded to me like therapist, friend, persuader, motivational coach, placebo effect, uh, all of which are great things. So the more you have these wealthy patients out there, the patients, in essence, are the people who work with the smart machines and augment their power, those people will be extremely wealthy. 
Those people will employ in different ways what you might call personal servants. And because those people are so wealthy, those personal servants will also earn a fair amount. So the, the gains from trade are always there. There's still a law of comparative advantage. Uh, I think people who are very good at working with the machines will earn much, much more. And the others of us will need to find different kinds of jobs. But again, if total output goes up, there's always an optimistic scenario. Doesn't your optimistic scenario require a long transition period? So if, if this technology was going to come about in over a period of 100 years, maybe we could sort of adjust society to that model. But if it's going to come about in the next 20 years, let's say, uh, wouldn't it be much harder to, to, to get there? We're going to have a long transition scenario. You look at something like chess, which is highly manageable, highly regular. It took really quite a long time to get chess playing machines to be able to beat the best humans. Go, the best humans are still better. Shogi, it's close. You look at a lot of different areas. There's medicine, there's law, there's economists. And they're going to proceed at different paces. There'll be a kind of slow, gradual turnover of the economy where different sectors get turned into smart machines and people shift sectors. Uh, and I don't see why it's the singularity scenario that we wake up one morning and the Terminator arrives and it's like, oh my god. I think that's pretty unlikely. Michael, what do you think? Well, I recommend Martin Ford's uh, uh, book. Uh, I read it when it came out. It, it's uh, the best discussion of the subject uh, I've read. And, and one of its uh, benefits is that he has anticipated all possible objections. <laughs> uh, and so I was looking at it this morning. <laughs> And uh, he basically said what I'm going to say. It's you know, one of the many cases, uh, uh, two in particular. Uh, first, that he's premature. Uh, and uh, second, that uh, related to that in the short run, I think that uh, you will create new labor-intensive uh, jobs, uh, at least in, in the short run, that will absorb a lot of the people what, shunt, shunted what, out of what the kind of, how, What kind of labor-intensive jobs? Well, he, here's the thing. Historically, rich people have tended to be the pioneers for the next wave of employment. Uh, I came across a great quote from Woodrow Wilson around 1900 when he was president of uh, Princeton, uh, saying that nothing excites socialistic feelings more than the sight of an automobile, right? And of course, you know, then you have Henry Ford. Everybody has, has a car. So if you have this process of Fordism, uh, what is happening as a result of productivity growth? Uh, a lot of mechanical tasks are being uh, mechanized or automated. Uh, an increasingly number of intellectual tasks are automated. Uh, so you would see a growth of personal service jobs mm -hmm. that cannot be automated. Well, we have those jobs today. They're jobs uh, of, of the servants of the rich, mm -hmm. right? So if, if you uh, take a working class person, you know, wins the lottery with the ticket, uh, becomes a billionaire, uh, that person is going to be surrounded That's by human lottery. beings, right? <laughs> could be surrounded by people doing things uh, that, that working class people do for themselves or do without. Mm -hmm. So there are these two categories, things that you would pay other people to do, mm -hmm. you know, chores and uh, uh, personal shopping and, and you name it, uh, or things that you don't even know you have as a desire, yeah. you know, like, like uh, you know, scent, scented aromatherapy in a, mm -hmm. a three-day spa. Mm -hmm until you actually have the resources for it. So the question is, if the prices are falling mm -hmm. you know, for within these, these amenity services, and at the same time the pool of labor is expanding, historically that's how we've gotten over this. This before. sounds like what Tyler's saying, right? I mean, it's very similar. It, yeah. it's, it's, the, it's, it's the optimistic view. And so the kinds of jobs that would be there are kinds of jobs like, like personal shopper, where it, you want I would want someone to be my personal shopper. I would want a human to be my personal shopper because it makes me feel good to pay a human to do that rather than a computer. I, I want a human's taste. These are, tell me why these are jobs that, I, that machines wouldn't do. Well, you know, part of it is demand. It, it's mm -hmm. simply, uh, my grandfather was an engineer who uh, worked in New York in the 1930s, and he thought that the automat was, was the wave of the future. This was a restaurant which had the first vending machines. Mm -hmm. So you should go, go in, put in, I guess it was a penny, and then the vending machine dropped. And so his vision was by the year 1950, that's how everyone would eat, right? Well, you go to a restaurant now, 
uh, if it's a moderate income restaurant, you have one person seats you, one person brings, you know, one person uh, uh, explains the specials and so on. So clearly there's, the, you know, we want to be around other people. Mm -hmm. You could come up with software to design your own house. Uh, but think about it. Uh, right now, only very affluent people can afford architect-designed homes. Mm -hmm. I think, what is more likely that people are going to spend, and, and also uh, technology is labor saving. Yeah. Are you going to spend the time to master the architecture software? Or would you have, let's say, the working class person can afford a working class architect with you know, very good CAD you know, uh, uh, tools? Uh, in, in the long run, I think Martin Ford is absolutely right. That is, eventually, if you, you get incredibly sophisticated, HAL 9000 type, <coughs> you know, Star Trek computers, you do have to rethink wage labor, which is about 150 years old in the North Atlantic countries and much younger uh, before that. So, so that could be an interesting question too. So, so Martin, what do you think of that, that suggestion by both well, of you? Well, I, I think that you know, it, it's a valid argument, but I, I have concerns um, primarily. On, it's about the concentration of income and the concentration of consumption that we see. And I think uh, the trends, the, the, you know, the technology trends are going to probably amplify that. Um, I mean, you're talking about jobs like personal shoppers. I mean, how many people really are there that are going to hire a personal shopper? I mean, you're talking about a very small number. But I guess they're saying that, you know, if personal shoppers cost a tenth of what they do now, then you, everyone would get one. Is, I mean, is that right? Is that a good summary? Or if I earned $10 million right. a year, I would hire a person just to take around my dry cleaning. Right. But I think basically we'll end up hiring other people to cheer us up. The restaurant example is a very good one. To go to Horn and Harder is depressing. You go to a restaurant, someone smiles, hello, Mr. Cowan, they bring you to the seat, the waiter, waitress comes by, they cheer you up. A lot of jobs will be about motivation. Just like the doctor here is motivating her patients, motivation will be one of the biggest employment sectors in this future. I don't know if you guys can tell this, but today for the first time, so I, I traveled and I didn't have a, I forgot my razor at home. And I went to a barber shop and I got somebody to shave me, <laughs> <laughs> which cost me forty dollars. Well, and I could have bought bought a razor for three dollars. But by the Is way, on, 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 on this on this point, uh, right? We, I'm paying this right. person to do a task that I could have done, right? We we always hear that the you should the kids should be studying STEM and mathematics and, and yeah. they're, well they're, the children are going to be competing with Darwinian algorithms. You right. know why why do that? Uh, teach your children to be obsequious and friendly. <laughs> Obsequity is going to be uh, uh, a great but, virtue. But I have the, to say, this market. optimistic scenario doesn't sound very optim. I mean, it doesn't. I don't uh -huh. want to. I don't want my child to be a personal shopper. Like, how, can we escape that? I mean, could uh, people do intellectual that's, work? That's part of it. I, I'm still doubtful about the numbers. I mean, keep in mind, we've got a workforce in the United States of 150 million people, at least that many people available to work. Um, I don't believe we're going to take all those working class jobs that are ultimately going to be eliminated by technology and have all those people working for a tiny number of very wealthy people. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this only works if you have service sector Fordism, to coin a term. In other words, if you take what are now luxury services and you mass produce them like the spas they offer in the mall, that's a different scenario. But then that implies... By Fordism, just let's talk about, explain what you Well, well Fordism in, in the 1920s was the idea that you have mass production but also mass consumption because the wages rise and the prices fall as a result of technology and, and until the automobile owner, a worker, can afford an automobile. So, so service sector Fordism, and, and different societies, this may not happen, but it would be a situation where the home health aide can afford the, the you know, modestly paid personal shopper or the modestly okay. paid caterer. But, but the about. question is going to be, can they afford housing and can they afford health care and can they afford energy? That's you know, the bulk of people's budget. So you're, you, this technology may drive down the price of manufactured goods. It may drive down, drive down the price of, of these kind of personal services. But how are the people who are performing these services for a wage going to earn enough to survive in, in the real world? That's a very different argument, because if you're really an optimist about smart machines, they'll make health care, education, and real estate much, much cheaper. If your son is a personal shopper, keep in mind, your son's basically an owner of capital. He only needs to work enough 
to buy some capital and earn this income stream because there's so much output. Mm -hmm. So to be a personal shopper for 10 hours a week, it's not as bad as it sounds. And I think for a barber, <laughs> uh, sound very bad. a lot of people today would trade in for that. And then you have all the people who work with the smart machines and augment their value. And surely not everyone can do that. But it's more than just some tiny elite. So you, wait, you're, so go back to this argument about, t tell me why it would be 10 hours a week. Because, because you'd, you'd just have to work for a little bit because everything would be so cheap? Absolutely. You could work more if you wanted. But, oh, but I think I, I, I disagree with that. You know, it was the assumption of Keynes and various others uh, that as I incomes went up, people would sort of max out and they would translate that into leisure. So uh, by the, essentially we would have decided in 1955 we would be satisfied with Magnavox TVs. And then we would stop working mm -hmm. 40 hours a week. My guess is that some of what happens is when, you know, the, the, both luxury goods and luxury services become cheap and mass produced. Mm -hmm. At that point, people keep working longer hours to get you know, like the new bio genetically designed pet or something that's the big status it symbol. I some think some will, but keep in mind the last 20 years the trend is that only the very wealthy work more and the rest of us work less. So people will decide, but if people want to work less, they'll be able to. But you're saying you'll be able, you'll, because, the, because the machines will be doing all this work and making everything cheaper, we'll have, ev everything will be cheap enough that we won't have to work all the time to do. Again, I'm putting on the optimist yes, hat, no. which was the request. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I mean, do you actually believe it then? Put on the other hat. You're going to get a lot of different results, and it, it will depend a great deal on the country, and most of all, how politics responds. One issue I also worry about, distinct from this issue, but I think in some ways very good drugs will be quite a threat to jobs. <laughs> Wait, explain that. <laughs> if drugs are really fun and totally safe, which may not be possible, we don't know, but you could imagine that as a technological advance. It's really going to cut into a lot of this the spending on the personal servants and getting your hair done and going to the spa. Just stay at home and take your drugs, right? <laughs> well, well so rock stars manage to do all of these things simultaneously. Sure. <laughs> so that's a competing force against smart machines. And in part, the future will be determined by you know, which, which set of forces are winning that race. Uh, okay, maybe we got a little far <laughs> off. <laughs> um, so, so Martin, I got this question a lot in comments to, in, on my series, which is, why are we assuming that the machines will get really good and the humans will stay behind? Um, you know, a lot of people who think about the future, you know, the singularity, Ray Kurzweil, think about machines making us better. Um, and so wh why won't that happen? Well, I think it may, but, but you know, Sort of the starting point for me is, is the recognition that most of the jobs, most of the work required by the economy has always been on some level fundamentally routine, I think. I think if you go back in history, you know, you had people working, um, working the land. That's a very routine job. Later, they, they moved to routine jobs in manufacturing. Today, they're more in the service sector. But most people um, at, ver you know, at all skill levels, they come to work and they face the same kinds of challenges day in and day out, uh, with not exactly the same, but within some narrow range of, of variation. And those types of tasks and jobs are increasingly going to be exactly what is appropriate for technologies like machine learning, for instance. Now, as we fast forward into the future, you know, if you believe what people like Ray Kurzweil say, we may have you know, brain implants and such that will make us much, much smarter, but that doesn't mean that the best way to take on a routine task is going to be to, you know, take a, a working class person and give them a brain implant to make them smarter. I mean, it's still going to be the case that a specialized machine is going to be best for performing a specialized task. Um, so in order for that, that kind of vision to result in employment for everyone, you have to imagine an economy that creates, you know, 150 million or more jobs for people to do non-routine creative type tasks and so that simply hasn't been the case historically i mean you know the people who really get paid to do creative things are, are relatively small in number and most other people have always done routine things um tyler what how do so, so you, you suggested there were two you know there were multiple different scenarios sure how do we what are some of the things we need to get to your optimistic scenario I mean, sort of regular, you know, in government, in society, 
education, things like that. I mean, you need health care and education to become sensible and accountability-based sectors, and to some extent deregulated, and they're very far from that. I can imagine a world where basically every child has a tutor. That won't employ everyone, but it will be a large number of jobs. Every old person has two people helping him or her out. That will be a large number of jobs. But right now, healthcare and education are total messes in ways which I think are pretty obvious to us all. And that risks the crack-up scenario where those things stay expensive and everything goes wrong. Right. So, so, so your scenario wouldn't work if we needed to, if those sectors didn't, got, they got more expensive as they got automated. But I think the smart machines will do an end run around the regulations, especially in education. Healthcare will be tougher and it will happen in other countries and people here will demand it and they'll basically just get it through the internet. So on that, I'm reasonably optimistic. Explain what you mean by the machines doing an end run around, like in education. How like it? education. The schools might stay terrible and require a lot of credentialism and certification. But if you can just buy an education box for your kid, you know, at Target, homeschool your kid, sit it by the education box, and have a private tutor come in sometime in the week and pool with other parents, that's going to work, even if there's no real reform in education. So I'm somewhat optimistic there. Well, I, I'm a bit more pessimistic on the, on the political side in as much as until the last uh, generation, really a couple of decades ago, you had a third of the human race living under Marxist-Leninist regimes where the way you had access to the goods of society was to worm your way up in the Communist Party hierarchy. Uh, you had much of the rest of the world, Latin America and much of East Asia, uh, was military dictatorships where the people at the top were not capitalists, they were not technologists, I mean they were people, they were soldiers. Uh, and as long as you have a world of territorial states, which we are going to have, uh, you're going to have different social systems, different social orders. Uh, and, and that was you know, my point about uh, uh, why you need to take alternatives to the wage system seriously. Uh, f uh, for most of human history, uh, people did not earn a living by selling their labor in a market. This is about a century, it's less than two centuries old, even in Britain and the United States. Mo you had a class of farmers, most of them unfree farmers, slaves or serfs. And then you had a class of parasites, the landlords who happened to be the warlords uh, to keep the farmers in line and to extract rents from them. So this whole experiment in everyone going out and being able to sell enough of your labor to afford the necessities of your life, uh, it was tried briefly in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, and it was considered such a failure in every industrial country that it was replaced by welfare state systems. Even it, whether, it didn't matter whether the, the country was a democracy or a junta, or uh, uh, there is no free labor market, no free retirement system, uh, no free market in, in uh, on a number of basic uh, labor-related subsistence goods in any modern technological society. I mean, if you're a libertarian, you can fantasize about what it would be like. But there's not a single territorial state on the, on the planet that does this. So it's already rigged, right? It's been rigged since Bismarck, right? And, and Franklin Roosevelt and, and you know, Perón and, and you, know, you name it. So I, I think that's the question. Uh, uh, and just one more point, uh, uh, briefly on this. Why did you have these welfare states and immigration restrictions and minimum wage laws and all of this stuff? It was because the political elites, who were not terribly enlightened necessarily, uh, they feared their people, right? They either feared the people uh, marching on them, overthrowing them, or they needed the people to fight wars, uh -huh. right? And one thing I, I worry about, it'd be interesting, you know, uh, uh, Martin's thoughts on this, as you move towards an increasingly robotic military, where it's essentially capital intensive. You don't need the peasants anymore. You know, uh, they're no, they're, if anything, they're a drag. They're not, they don't add to your national strength. And at the same time, uh, it's really difficult for highly dispersed populations, you know, simply to overthrow the government the way it was back when you had one capital city mm -hmm. surrounded by a lot of, of poor people. Uh, I, I just think you have to factor in the political side. You know, you can't just assume this is all going to be solved by the market. That's somehow. the pessimistic side. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's true that, that it's hard to be optimistic if you look at the politics of it. Um, 
Ultimately, I think the solution is going to be something that, that Tyler mentioned earlier, which is a, a basic guaranteed income. Um, you know, we're going to have to get away from the idea that people have to have a wage-paying job in order to survive. Um, and that's what I advocate in my book. But, uh, you know, politically, it's very, very hard to imagine that in terms of what's, what's happening today. But it's, it's not just politically hard to imagine that. I think it's socially difficult to imagine that. I mean, a lot of people find meaning of, of their life through work. A lot of people kind of think about their work as being their that, life's that, goal. That's right. And that's it, the idea that I've advocated is that we should take a basic income and then we should modify it with certain incentives, um, most important of which would be education. Just, just as an example, suppose we paid everyone some minimal basic income, but if you graduate from high school or pass your equivalency test, then you actually get a somewhat higher income. Imagine what, what that would do for the high school graduation rate. And so we could, we could build some basic incentives, um, some of which might occupy people's time and give them some purpose into, into that sort of a scheme. But you know, a basic income, I know it, it sounds very radical. Probably a lot of people see it as, as a very leftist, uh, welfare state run amok type thing. But actually, it's, it's very much a free market idea. Uh, Friedrich Hayek supported a basic income. Uh, Milton Friedman supported a negative income tax. Which well, yeah, and Franklin Roosevelt and Lyndon Johnson opposed it. Because the whole basis of the welfare state liberalism in the United States is that a job is a right, you know, for whatever reason in that historical period. Work was central to your identity yeah. as a citizen. So Johnson and, and Roosevelt hated uh, paying people who weren't working. You know, they wanted public works. Right. But they did pay farmers for not planting, right? And it's well, not, that was it's a not, different, that's a macroeconomic. It's, it's not that much of a stretch to me. To, you know, they're, they're, they're somewhat similar. But I think in the future we may have to, you know, evolve in that direction. But there simply aren't going to be enough paying jobs out there for a lot of people. And and even to the extent that the new, if your theory is correct, that there are going to be all these personal service jobs, you can see right away that there's going to be a structural mismatch. And we already have a problem that we can't employ working class men, and and women are doing better. And and you know, if you're talking about personal shoppers and this type of thing, you're going to skew things even more in that direction. I think. Tyler, you mentioned the. The guaranteed wage. What do you think of that idea? Well, it can't be afforded now, but parts of Western Europe already have something not so far from it, and it would enable us to get rid of a lot of other bad government policies. So I think if we can find a way to get there, it's a better outcome than just piling more in different parts of the welfare state on top of each other. So I, I don't think it's so unrealistic. It is for 2011. And I think it would be a mistake to have it now. But if you're thinking about 70 years from now, mm -hmm. I, I more or less expect it. Well, we, we have it now in the sense that tax expenditures like the child tax credit, yeah. earned income tax credit, these are really wage subsidies, mm -hmm. you know, going to working people. So already you have uh, part of your income is your actual market wage. And then part of it is this government subsidy. So you could actually get to something like Martin describes by gradually shifting sure. the, the ratio. What about this other problem that Martin talks about, which is if we, do, if we do move to an economy where the job that humans do is this personal service work, there may be a lot of people, maybe men, maybe you know, other people, maybe people with bad taste, people who just don't have the aptitude for that kind of work. What do, what do those people do? I think this Drugs. new... <laughs> Drugs. <but the> new <laughs> The new order, it, you can already see this, will favor conscientiousness as a personality yeah. trait. And on average, that will favor female labor, I think. Uh, I think there will be some decent percentage of people who, not quite for economic reasons, but for reasons of temperament, are simply going to do very badly in this order. And I think some of those people will end up living in a kind of shanty town, uh, getting a very low income. With other people who with have other people attitudes. like that, yeah. <laughs> and today we call those prisons, or you have tent cities, or in developing countries, a place like Brazil, you just have people living in low rent areas and not getting good public services, and I think that will be part of the new equilibrium for some people. People basically who are not conscientious enough to simply take a job. There's a rich person willing to pay them. What they're supposed to do isn't that hard. The wage isn't bad, but they just can't do it. And those people, in my view, will be the big losers. Do you think Michael's right when he says that the things we should teach our kids is be obsequious? <laughs> be well, diligent and obsequious. Yeah. An alternative option for these equilibria is peop that people have a lot more kids. So there'll be a, a pretty cheap supply of very high quality labor, people who can look after your kids 
And you can monitor their quality and reliability much better than you can now. So I think in a world of smart machines, it could be that the norm is to have five to seven children again, not necessarily through traditional birth. Uh, people will get a lot more pleasure <laughs> from children. Uh -huh. uh, not everyone, but I think you'll see a lot more people doing this. You already see this among a lot of billionaires or very wealthy millionaires, that they have a lot more kids. It's a new trend. You see it in the numbers. It's now a small number of people. But when you get bored with a lot of other stuff, you reach a certain age, technology gives you greater flexibility. It's like, why not have six kids? And, and overpopulation won't be a problem because the machines will take care of things? <laughs> well, I didn't say it won't be a problem, okay. right? There'd be an, an environmental issue that probably will be a problem. But it's a way of thinking about where the jobs will come from. If everyone has six kids yeah. and they all need nannies, smart nannies, reliable, conscientious nannies, it's an awful lot of jobs. Well, the point I'd like to make is, and, and we were sort of joking about obsequiousness and diligence and all of that, but with every shift in the majority of the workforce from one sector to the next, mm -hmm. the workers in the previous sector despised the emerging sector as beneath the dignity of, of, of an ordinary American, at least, speaking the Anglo-American uh, tradition. So when you first had factories in uh, Massachusetts and, and in New England, uh, they could only get farm girls to do it because it was unmanly to work in a factory job. Now, you think of the factory job as being like the he-man sort of thing, but that was for women. Real men were farmers. Well, and so then it took this whole cultural thing where you could actually work in a factory and take orders from a foreman without knifing him to death, you know, and all of this. Uh, and so then you had office work, right? Uh, but that was wimpy. Right? I mean, the blue collar worker you know, w was much tougher than Ward Cleaver going to the office in the 1950s. So I, I do think that there is, you call it feminization or, or yeah. you know, whatever, but, but there is this trend to get away from the self reliant male yeoman who's completely self sufficient. And it's just, it's a, it's a cultural shock for men in particular, I, th I think, and, and breadwinners and so mm -hmm. on. But that, that's nothing new. I mean, that's been going on through the Industrial Revolution. I mean, it's a long-term trend. Well, one thing I'd add, though, is that I feel the discussion right now is taking on kind of a working-class flavor, flavor. You know, what are we going to do with these working-class people? But we need to remember that part of what we've been talking about here is that the, all this stuff is going to impact what I would call the upper middle class, the educated middle class. I mean, we're going to see these technologies unfold and begin to really undermine a lot of skilled professions. I mean, we've talked about doctors and lawyers, but I think the people that are likely to be hit the hardest are going to be the corporate drone type people, the people that sit in a cubicle inside an organization and they don't really have any of the protections that uh, doctors and lawyers have. So as that kind of unfolds, to me it, it, it's going to ultimately raise a question of what do we do with these more skilled people that are on, or should be on the path to success? What do we do with new college graduates? What do we do with people who are in their 40s and 50s and, and are perhaps impacted by these trends uh, you know, in, in the middle of their careers. Um, I mean, in, in the first panel, you heard, you heard them talking about sports writing and how it could automate this and all that. Uh, to me, what, what jumps out is that a lot of entry-level positions are really going to be heavily impacted because those are more routine jobs. And so how are we going to get the next generation sort of on the path to success? Um, well, should we, should we weep, though, for the, the mid-career lawyers who are going to be replaced by legal software? I mean, this is a fairly elite group. You know, if, if, if you go, again, back to the 19th century, uh, you had these very highly paid Welsh iron mongers had to be imported from Wales, you know, for the early iron factories. Uh, and then you had the Bessemer steel process, and then unskilled people could do it. Mm -hmm. I think you're right, you know, and, and, and you may have written about this, too. You know, a lot of this, the professions, a lot of human capital, it's going to be replaced by digital capital and software. Th the number of people who are affected is fairly small, and they're overpaid, frankly, right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and society gains so much from this. It just doesn't seem to me to be a big problem. Well, if you just, just looking at lawyers, then and it's doctors fairly small. Too. But if it's and if you, if you but don't just focus on labor income. Think about capital income. Anyone who inherits anything from their parents, which admittedly is not everyone, but they can just live off the capital their whole life. Labor is 68% of GDP. If you imagine all that labor, all those jobs going away, every single one, and we have more output, you just have these staggeringly high returns to capital. Unless you have eight kids. 
even then, divide <laughs> by eight, people will still be doing pretty well. So having access to capital income, I think, is the main question, not what your job will be. I'm, Martin, I, so I'm starting to be won over by their argument about kind of the, sh the future of personal shoppers. Like, <laughs> and, 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 and nannies. And nannies. I mean, especially, if this is sort of the, the, you know, the admittedly the most optimistic view. Um, but do, I mean, I guess I wonder, do you think that it's impossible? Do you think that that kind of thing could happen? Are you wavering? I, I'm not wavering. I, I don't, you know, I think one thing we need to consider is the impact of all this on, on consumption. As, as jobs begin to erode, as, as income becomes more and more concentrated, um, consumption also becomes more concentrated. Right now we see the top 5% of the population in terms of income doing over 35% of the consumption. Now the trends that we're talking about here are going to impact even that top 5%. I mean, a lot of these highly skilled jobs that, that pay higher wages are going to be impacted. All of the people that make up the, the bottom 95% are going to even more heavily be impacted. Um, you know, it, it's hard to see how you maintain consumption going forward as, as, as this unfolds. Well, I, I just wa I, it seems to me there's a, a possible contradiction in what you're saying because on the one hand, your argument is based on productivity growth. Uh, on the other hand, you're sort of, when you're talking about consumption, Assuming and we're having this rapid productivity growth right now, we had rapid productivity growth in the Depression, and, and I, th I think in, you're quite right about that. But that means even with stagnant wages, your purchasing power increases as, as some well, of these other it, it, uh, uh, goods become cheaper and cheaper, right? In terms of you know, some manufactured goods, uh, that's true. But f again, in terms of if you look at the budget that the average person faces, productivity increases don't necessarily make land cheaper, right? They don't. They don't make housing costs cheaper, at least not in the shorter run. Well, you know, um, Elizabeth of land. Yeah, yeah. Th it depends on where you live. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, in her book on the middle class, is something absolutely fascinating. Uh, basically, people pay much more now uh, for real estate than their parents did in order to be in good neighborhoods with good public mm -hmm. schools, mm -hmm. right? And the reason they're in the good public schools is because it's pre-college. Right. And the reason you want to go to college is you want to get the skill-intensive, non-yet-automated professional degree. I wonder if you don't have, have all this unravel, if you no longer want your kid to grow up to be a professional, then there's this kind of cash. falling dominoes, then you don't need to... Buy your education box. Buy the education bucks. box, yeah, that's right. You don't have to be in that suburban neighborhood, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, well, I, 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 I ask you because you mentioned education. Right now, people, most people, having taught at various universities, they want jobs. That's their goal. They're not doing this out of, out, out of pleasure and learning. If you don't need that in terms of uh, the job, then why would people spend more money on education? Well, I think that, that you know, as this unfolds, though, you, you've got a lot of people right now that, that are, are living in homes. They've got mortgages. As, as unemployment increases, you know, we're going to see more defaults. I mean, it's going to impact the entire financial system. I mean, system. I think there's a, you guys are fundamentally disagreeing about kind of the time horizon here. I mean, Tyler said earlier that he thinks it's going to take, you know, not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to take more time. Under your scenario, you're talking about people right now. Um, it seems, it sounds like, you know, you think that this is going to happen a lot faster than they do. Well, I think it's, I think it's already having an impact. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, we, if you look at um, the last 20, 30 years, what we've seen is that wages have been completely stagnant. Um, productivity has obviously increased, but the fruits of that productivity increase has, has really gone to a tiny number of people at the top. I mean, it hasn't been broadly distributed at all. And yet, at the same time, we continue to see housing costs, healthcare costs are rising. Um, in the short run, what I see is unemployment increasing, perhaps gradually, um, across the board at both skilled and, un and lesser skilled professions. Um, whereas the longer run impacts in terms of really bringing down healthcare costs or really bringing down housing costs are, are I think, further out there. Um, so I think we're, we're going to get into a situation where uh, unemployment and stagnant wages and, and increasing concentration of income and consumption are going to occur over the next 10 years, but uh, you know, I'm kind of doubtful that you're going to see a dramatic reduction in health care costs, for instance, over the next 10 years. Okay. Um, we are at time for questions. Um, do we have some questions? Uh, 
Hi, uh, my name is Hamoun Ishragi. Um, I just wanted to ask what you guys thought that all of this, I didn't hear anything about social mobility, but I think that that plays a really important role in at least America's rise and America's story. And you know, for someone who might be aspiring to be a medical student, would you say now that maybe a $200,000 investment in their education is, is a bad expenditure, that they should just save that and, and you know, try to use their inheritance to become part of, I don't know, the capitalist class? Yeah, what do you, I mean, uh, we hear more and more about people who spend a lot on, on, on law school not getting good jobs. Is, that, is it a good idea to spend money on that kind of education? Uh, oh, lower returns for lawyers are great, I think. They need to be much lower yet. In your case with medical school, I suspect the cartel will protect you long enough. So I would say go for it. Yeah, I, I think if you look at where we have cancerous cost inflation in this country, uh, it's in two areas where you still have a guild craft-like organization mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm. of production. It, it's law and medicine and maybe even the professoriate with this oh. kind of the tenure professors <laughs> and the, you know, the, the lecturers. Uh, someone is going to figure out, whether it's mm -hmm. done by government regulation or by the private sector, you're going to have the Henry Ford of higher education and medicine and law. And the prices will drop. And, and actually, the wages may rise at the bottom. I mean, the nurses may get raises and the lecturers may be paid more, uh, even as the professor's pay goes down. Uh, so, so, you know, in, in that sense, to invest in the medieval education for the skills of the craft that is about to be annihilated, I would think twice about that. Okay, one more question. Uh, yeah, charging basis the man. Uh, I would like to know to know what would be the economy system. Uh, uh, what would be the wage for the robber, and who would possess those wage? What would be the economic system? You said. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess we don't Do have we an answer. To that? But well, well, what I've advocated is that we're still going to have a free market economy, but then we'll we'll adapt that with, with some sort of a basic income to provide support for people. Um, if we don't do that, I think there's a risk that, that we could, at some point in the future, you know, decide that socialism is what is the only thing that works. I mean, if capitalism really fails. Uh, well, I, I think if, if you, as I was saying earlier about politics, uh, the Roman emperor Septimus Severus uh, uh, gave his dying advice was keep the soldiers happy. Uh, at the end of the day, as long as you have territorial states and the, they depend on the police and the military who tend to come from, you know, undistinguished backgrounds, you're going to have some rigged system by which at least some of the gains from, from growth, even in a robotic economy, are going to ordinary people. We'll have a meritocracy of IU and conscientiousness, for better or worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys.